just to give you an idea of, of me and how serious I am as a scientist, I thought I would start with this really short clip. So here's me in the field. So this is really cool. What we've just found, you can see, is one, two, three, four pieces of mammoth bone here. This is part of a vertebra, so you can see how big this is. And the neat thing about this is that these are the small pieces, which means that the stuff is washed downstream. See, these pieces are actually still frozen in the permafrost. We can't get them out at all, which means they're going to be really well preserved. Just heard that big splash of water back there. That means another hole is broken through. Here comes the water. We better get out of here. <laughs> so in my defense, <laughs> that water is really gross. It's, uh, so what, what's going on up there is there's all these uh, plaster miners. They're, they're gold miners, and they're looking to get to the gold-bearing gravels, which are beneath all of that frozen dirt that you saw. Frozen dirt is also known as permafrost. But that frozen dirt isn't just dirt. It's actually the preserved and slightly decayed material that has accumulated there over the course of the last several tens of thousands of years. So when it warms up in the sun, and then they wash away, and they collect it in these giant puddles. They then spray again on top of that frozen dirt, and it comes down on you. It smells like 20,000 years of rotting mammoth flesh, and you do not want to be covered in that stuff. So, in my defense, that water is really gross, as I said. So, the field that I work in is called ancient DNA. It is more than 15 years old. It is actually almost 30 years old, so, you know, got a little bit of a history in us. The very first little bit of ancient DNA that was extracted was in 1984, and it was from this guy, which was a, it was extinct at the time, and there was a piece of its skin, a koala skin, that was preserved in a museum in South Africa. And a team of researchers at UC Berkeley in Alan Wilson's lab managed to use a process called molecular cloning. This is a kind of an old school way of trying to get DNA out of stuff. And amplified and sequenced a tiny fragment of this guy's genome. And we're able to do an analysis to prove that this individual was a type of zebra. Now, I know that based on this picture, you're extremely shocked by that scientific revelation. Right? Um, and I am too, obviously. Uh, no, I'm not. It wasn't particularly revelatory scientifically. But the idea that DNA was preserved in remains of things that were dead was revelatory and really did kick off this entire field called ancient DNA. And over the last 30 years, we've developed increasingly sophisticated technologies to get DNA from all sorts of things. And we know that DNA is well preserved in all sorts of materials ranging from bones to teeth, especially roots to hair. We can get DNA from hair. It does not need a root, regardless of what you hear on CSI. Don't listen to them. We can get DNA out of mummified remains. That's a baby cave line that was found in Siberia a couple summers ago. There were actually two little baby cave lines that were found crushed in a collapsed cave. Um, DNA in mummies is actually more poorly preserved than DNA in hair and teeth and skin. And we think this is because the gut, which is full of bacteria and other microbes, bursts at some point during mummification, and all that stuff circulates throughout the circulatory system and chews up the DNA that it comes into contact with. We can also get DNA directly from shells, from the insides and outsides, from seeds, as long as they haven't been cooked and charred, from plant remains, all sorts of different tissues, dried and for bearing collections, and from things like the intestinal contents of a mammoth, or dried fecal samples, museum specimens. We can get DNA from the Rates of, of air filtration cartridges, which is really creepy, but something that is absolutely true. And we even had, I like to use this here too, this book here, here at the end. A few years ago, we were asked um, by an auction house to help them to identify the type of skin that was used to create this skin book pie, this tan skin. And um, it was human, so that's gross, but uh, you know, <laughs> we can get DNA from tanned books. Too. So there's lots of DNA in, in everything. So I came into ancient DNA in the late 1990s, and this was really early days of ancient DNA, and people were busy dividing up the taxa that we were allowed to work with. You know, 
Some people got the Neanderthals, others got bears and lions, and I got bison because I was last and no one was interested in bison. Um, it was a time when everybody was interested in very specific questions. If you're interested in Neanderthals, you wanted to know what it is that made humans special, or what about the evolutionary history of our own species. If you're interested in carnivores, maybe you wanted to think about how these things went and extinct. With bison, I wasn't really that disappointed because I was really motivated by questions about conservation. I've grown up thinking about the world that's outside and how the actions that we take as a species are impacting things. And, you know, we see things like um, there have been many recent studies that show that the rate of extinction that uh, is currently ongoing with lots of different taxa is way higher than the background rate in the fossil record. And the dashed line here, right, is the background rate in the fossil record. Extinctions happen all the time. What's different about today is that the rate is, most people agree, somewhere between at least 22-fold to maybe several thousand-fold, depending on what taxonomic group you're thinking about, higher than the background record. We really are in a biodiversity crisis. And recently, um, about six months ago, the UN released a report saying that more than a million species are threatened with extinction imminently. But one thing that this report left out, which is potentially a more imminent threat, is actually the decline of species that aren't considered endangered or in imminent risk of extinction. Because across the world, there are populations of species that are declining individually. And if you count up the individuals, it may look like the species are doing just fine. But if each population is declining, and the ways that we're changing the habitat is cutting off the connectivity between those populations, then this is a major threat. As those populations disappear, the genetic diversity in that population disappears, as does the potential, the capacity of that species to react, to evolve, to change, and to respond to the types of changes that are ongoing around us. So my motivation for getting into ancient DNA was really to try to see if we could use information from the past, from past periods of rapid extinction events. We know, for example, that there was a major mass extinction at the end of the last ice age, when things like mammoths, mastodons, giant bears all went extinct. Could we learn something from these past extinction events that will provide us with more scientific information that we can then use when we're trying to make decisions about how to protect and preserve species in the present day? So I've worked mainly in a part of the world that's known as Beringia. Um, Beringia spans basically from the Mackenzie Mountains here all the way across the Bering Strait over here to this particular mountain chain in Siberia. And you see that the, the color under the sea is a lot lighter here. That's because it's shallower. So during ice ages, when much of the planet's water was taken up in making the giant glaciers that sat on top of the continents, the sea level was lower, and all of that land was exposed. And Beringia, from here to here, was too dry to have massive glaciers formed across it, but sufficiently wet to create an incredible grassland refuge for all of the species that we've come to associate with the Ice Age. There were mammoths, there were woolly rhinos in Asia, they didn't make them to North America, several different species, of course, as we're now learning, species of camels, etc. And these species were using Beringia as a conduit to move between these two continents. And in fact, so were we. We were moving during the same period when all of these extinctions were happening from Asia into North America. So there are two things going on. There are, there is incredible climate change, habitat reorganization and restructuring, and the first appearance of people on this landscape and sophisticated hunting technologies. Today, the landscape looks more like this. Um, this is actually in uh, north central Russia, the Tiger Peninsula. I'm in this helicopter taking the picture, and I'll show you that helicopter in a minute because it's pretty awesome. Um, but you can see that this landscape is very barren. There's no trees. There's really hardly any big grasses. There are quite a lot of flowers if you get down the bottom. But you see this topography here, where you see these cuts. This is, uh, this is caused by the freeze-thaw action of this permafrost. It's very wet and very swampy. So compare this to the previous picture where you saw all of that incredible diversity of carnivores and herbivores and plants, the grassland diversity, and ask what happened. This is a plot 
of uh, the reconstruction of the average temperature, this is based on data, isotopic data from ice cores, that shows what the average temperature of the planet looked like between the present day, although this leaves off the last 100 years, where we see this increase over here, all the way back to around 100,000 years ago. And there are a couple things that stand out here. First, Around this time period, there's a lot of change. It is a very tumultuous period in Earth history. Where there's lots of warming and lots of cooling events. And this is very different to different places across the world. And second, you see this particular rapid warming event. This is the transition between the last ice age and the present warm interval, which we call the Holocene. And we have dates and from this interval, which we can see very clearly at some of our sites near Dawson City that suggests that this approximately eight degree warming event happened over the course of maybe two or three decades. That is a very rapid global warming event that had incredible consequences for the plant and animal communities that lived in the habitats at the time. And we can go back and collect the remains of the organisms that lived across this entire interval and ask what happened to the plant and animal communities around this time of rapid warming. And what happened earlier when the first humans appeared in large numbers in North America? And can we try to distinguish between these two competing hypotheses about what is driving this megafaunal mass extinction event? And if we can look at the entire ecosystem, these communities, we can answer the question potentially about how species are going to respond to the types of tumultuous changes that are predicted for the next century by going into the past and asking how ecosystems and communities predicted, how ecosystems and communities changed in response to past episodes that were similar in scale, although not necessarily exactly the same as what we're um, expected to to, to, to to So we fly out into the Arctic. Um, this is that helicopter I found a picture of. You'll notice several awesome things about it. Um, first, you see these giant gas tanks. That's, that's wonderful. They take up most of the inside of the helicopter. So we throw all of our stuff in there. We get to sit on them on the inside. And second, you see that some of the windows don't actually have glass in them. And that's very helpful because um, when the Russian and French expedition teams that put together this particular expedition celebrated the final liftoff of the helicopter. It took three tries over the course of five days to actually leave. They did so by smoking. <laughs> so while we were sitting on the gas tanks, we could breathe better with the open windows. <laughs> We say five-star accommodation. This is, uh, this is again from Tiger. I mentioned how wet it was down there. Of course, what happens when it's very wet? Well, there's lots of mosquitoes. I actually took this picture by backing up and unfocusing the lens of my camera so that I could, uh, that I could actually take a picture of the depth of field of mosquitoes that are, that are there. So there's, there's, there's lots of fun. It's fun, fun field work. Everybody wants to be in my lab. It's great. And, uh, <laughs> We collect remains. This is a, a, a stop motion uh, picture taken by one of our field assistants one year, Tyler Coop. And uh, these, what, we're, what he's doing here is showing what happens. So they're washing away here this uh, frozen dirt. This is the gross water that washes up the ice here. And all of this stuff has been allowed to thaw by sitting in the sun for a little bit. And they do this to wash away the couple of centimeters of thawed, and then they stop and wait for the next couple of centimeters to thaw, and they wash that away. As they're doing that, Thousands of bones come washing out of here, or sometimes we see them lodged still in the frozen bits that they're not washing down. Here's some of my crew sort of wandering around, picking up the bones as they, as they fall out of the permafrost. And we get a lot of bones. This is a, a class two years ago. I taught a, a class at UC Santa Cruz where I took 15 undergraduates on a three and a half week camping trip up in Yukon. And one of the things we did is we went to these sites and I told them they would all find mammoth bones and nobody believed me. And we got out of the trucks and within 10 minutes they all found mammoth bones. So yeah, we find a lot of bones and all of these have DNA in them. This is um, a mammoth femur that uh, we picked up on the Ixic River in northern Alaska a few years ago, and uh, here we have a little horse bone that we found over right there. So there's lots of ways that we can find these bones. We can get easily get DNA out of bones. Also, teeth. This is a baby mammoth tooth that we found that the students found two years ago when we were there. And this is a wolf pup that was recovered from Klondike um, last summer. That's where we're working on getting DNA from the hair, and it's going to be on display in the Rinty Museum in Whitehorse. If you're interested in going to check it out.
And we can also get DNA directly from dirt. So it, this is a, a really neat way to look at the entire ecosystem, the entire community of stuff, you know, with, with plants and with microbes. We can't find the big pieces of the things that used to be alive to get DNA out of them. But what we can do is we can take these sediment plugs here. This is time with the oldest things down here and the youngest things at the top. And we can drill these cores into this, into this sort of section. And we can use genetic profiling to figure out what all of the plants and all of the animals and all of the microbes were that were there. And then catalog how the diversity of that ecosystem changes over time. This particular site is a site that's called Lucky Lady. These are all gold mines. We all have gold mining kind of names. And this here is the Holocene. You can see this layer that's full of sticks and other sorts of organic material. That is exactly in past. When the ice age ended and everything started to warm up and the grassland community transitioned first to shrubs and then to trees. And we can see that precisely in this record. And we can take sediment cores from above and below this and actually ask what the community looked like up here and what the ecosystem and community looked like down here and how these changed over time. And with all of these samples, we take a tiny little chunk of them and we take them back to our lab where we dress up like crazy people because we're worried about ancient microbes infecting us. No, because our DNA is in really good condition and the DNA that we're able to recover from all these old sites is in really bad condition. And if we were to breathe on or touch or in any way contaminate these samples, we wouldn't be able to do our experiments. So we have a clean lab that's actually inverted from a clean lab. Whereas most clean labs have negative air pressure to keep the dangerous stuff inside, we have positive air pressure to push all of the modern DNA outside. Um, you would think that no one would walk into this lab, given that we're dressed like this, but uh, sometimes people come in to change the trash or do things and that's terrible because we have to shut everything down for a week and bleach all of the counters and the surfaces and everything else. The students have to wash and bleach, they shower and bleach and I'm exaggerating. They don't shower and bleach at all. <laughs> if it were legal though I wouldn't make them. <laughs> Just kidding, really not that mean. So what have we learned from all this crazy work that, that we're doing? Well I told you that I started working on bison and over the years we've collected a ton of data, many hundreds of bison have given up bison bones, have given up their, the secrets of their DNA so that we can try to reconstruct the dynamics of this population over the last 50 to 100,000 years. And what we have here are two plots. The pink one is for bison and the blue one is for horses that show changes in their size of their population over time. So if it's bigger, they have a bigger population and lower numbers have a smaller population. And what you see is that there's a ton of dynamics going on in these systems. Bison populations were large, and then they started to decline, but they declined well before the peak of the last ice age. And then when we have the first burst of human colonization in North America, people were there longer than this, but this is about the time when we start seeing large numbers of people, particularly in the lower 48, there is a precipitous decline in bison, but then they recover. Horses, on the other hand, have a slightly gender trajectory. And this is what we've seen when we've looked at all the species separately. Every species is responding individualistically in its own way to the climate changes and the changes that humans are causing to the landscape. This particular collaboration between bison and horses is driven by the different way that they partition the resources. Bison need very rich grasslands in order to survive, whereas horses can deal with the kind of crappy or shrubby nonsense that comes in once the grasslands disappear. So when bison start to decline, horses temporarily do a little bit better. And we're really beginning to tease apart how these ecosystems are working together as these climate changes happen. We've also discovered quite a lot about other things that were going on, different species that we didn't even know existed. A few years ago, uh, we characterized a different type of horse called a stilt-legged horse um, that we thought was really closely related to the horses that we all know and love today, the best of horse. But in fact, it's very deeply diverged from these sites. It's ancestral to all of the equids that we know today. We got to name a new species after this particular individual we didn't know was there. Two weeks ago, um, we had a new exciting discovery. One of my grad students, Elisa Virginina, has been working on getting DNA from a skull from a horse bone that we found up in the Klondike a few years ago that we thought was a regular horse. And we just developed a new approach to be able to um, get 
even more of the tiny little bits of grubby DNA out of these remains that we were able to do previously. And then we thought, we have this really old horse. In fact, it's really old. Um, it's about 700,000 years old, maybe a little bit older. So it ties the record for the oldest bone, the oldest organism ever for which DNA has been recovered. And she extracted DNA from this particular horse, and we amplified it and sequenced its genome and pieced it together, and she put together the first phylogenetic tree. And it turns out that it is not a horse. It is, in fact, a different species, a thing that paleontology never knew. It is from a lineage that is um, ancestral to donkeys and zebras and keons. It's probably the lineage that it or its cousins migrated across the very straight sometime after that, and eventually gave rise to all of these other African horses that were there. But the only reason it was discovered two weeks ago by my grad student is because she extracted DNA from a skull that, oops, extracted DNA from a skull that, uh, that she thought was a regular horse. These are the kind of amazing discoveries that we can make just by being able to generate DNA data from these old fragments of bones that we find. And the other thing that we're discovering is different types of interactions between species that we didn't know existed. A few years ago, we did a study where we were, we were asking about um, the origin of the brown bears that live on Alaska's ABC Island. They're kind of weird bears. They have a DNA that they inherit from their mom that looks just like polar bears rather than like other brown bears. And this was very confusing. And it led to some speculation that polar bears might have evolved from this weird population of brown bears off the coast of southeastern Alaska, which couldn't really be true because those islands were totally covered in ice 20,000 years ago. And polar bears and brown bears are much more deeply diverged from each other than just 20,000 years. When we sequence their genomes, what we learn is that that population of brown bears that lives in southeastern Alaska used to be polar bears that at the last ice age, polar bears were pushed all the way down onto those islands. And then as the ice left, those polar bears were stranded. And as the islands became better habitat for brown bears, brown bear boys moved from the Alaskan mainland onto those islands and admixed with, hybridized with those polar bears, eventually converting them back into something that looked and acted like a brown bear, but still had that tiny bit of DNA inherited from their mom who was a polar bear, who's only the boys came over from Alaska, that made everything confusing. And this is the kind of interaction that we're just finding by looking at DNA. That whenever the climate changes, we push species together into habitats where they haven't been together before. And when that happens, they introduce they share DNA. And in doing so, there's the potential for new evolutionary adaptations to arise. Climate change that changes habitats, that changes distributions, isn't all bad. Sometimes it's an opportunity for evolutionary novelty. And these are the kinds of things that we're learning by looking into the past. And I always think that these are really exciting things to talk about. So we publish these papers, and sometimes they get picked up by the popular press, and people want to talk about it, et cetera. And I'm always super excited. I'm going to tell people how we're learning from the past, and I'm going to talk about biodiversity, and it's going to be great, and people are going to start thinking about how their actions are driving species extinct, and they're going to change their ways, and the world is going to be a better place. But the journalists really um, only ever want to ask me one thing. <laughs> and quite honestly, I've been really, really tired of answering this question. <laughs> I'm so tired of that, that I wrote a whole book about it, because you really can't give like, a really short answer to this. I'm going to answer this question. I will, I promise. That's why you're here tonight. You want to know the answer. But first, <laughs> see, you just know it's all, I forced you to listen to science for a minute, though. There you go. Um, so, but I'm going to ask you two questions, right? First, why do you want to bring a mammoth back to life? Seriously, and this is a serious question. Why do you want to bring a mammoth back to life? Is it because it'd be cool? Because you want to look at it? Because you want to put it in a zoo and go stare at it? Or because you really think that there's something compelling for the ecosystem about bringing this extinct species back to life. I'm going to assume the latter, right? Because you know, we're all here. We're, we're thinking people. We're not mean. We're not going to bring back a living organism just so we can stare at it, make fun of it, maybe point, pet it, ride it, eat it. <laughs> you know, we're good. So second, if this is something that you want to do because it's a strategy for conserving species, where does it fit 
in the spectrum of strategies that we are willing to use as a society to try to deal with the biodiversity crisis that's underway today. So I guess to think through that, we really have to start by thinking about what our current strategies are. And as I see it, there are really three ways, three strategies we can divide this thing into, um, three paths to preserving biodiversity. The first is the stuff that we're doing right now. This is good stuff. We are trying to limit pollution. We're trying to um, create reserves. We're trying to curate those reserves. We're trying to protect species by exciting people about the benefits that we get as a society for having biodiversity. These are all good approaches. The second is maybe moving into the world of science fiction. Thinking about using modern biotechnologies to help in the effort to conserve species. So the third, obviously, is de-extinction. So before we get into this, I would like to take a poll of the audience, all right? I'll be raise your hand once, and I'm going to ask you which of these you are happy with. If you're happy with A, then that's just A. If you're happy with B, I'm assuming A plus B. If you're happy with C, I'm assuming you're happy with all of them. Is this clear? We got this? Okay. Wait, Who? Can you define genetic rescue? Mm, I will, but all I mean by this at this point is just thinking about using technologies, using biotechnologies, but not going so far as bringing extinct species back to life. Alright? So who is good with A? Good. Smattering of people here. Conservative among us. That's good. <laughs> B? Good, good. That's a lot of you. And C, the extension? Heck yeah. We got some people who are out there that are like, bring back the mammoths. That's right. <laughs> bring back the mammoths. So A, here's the strategy for A. We, we certainly do have to do, continue to do the types of things that we do in the strategy of A. Just all the things that we currently, there's a lot of technology that goes into this as well. We need to continue to create terrestrial and meat marine reserves that can protect and preserve these different species. We can develop um, agricultural techniques that are less wasteful, that are less likely to pollute the landscape. We can think of alternative energy platforms. We can become better gardeners of these lands that we protect by removing invasive species. And we can use technologies like radio tracking. Here's a, a radio tracking monarch that you can actually follow monarchs in the past by looking at this tiny little little light over here, or an actual radio collar here that we put on on mountain lines. I was actually brought recently into a collaboration. There's a there's a group in Santa Cruz called the Santa Cruz Puma Project that uses radio collars to try to track the diversity of mountain lions. Mountain lions are the same animal, in case you're wondering, as a puma. A cougar, a panther, the catamount, these are all the same animal. It has a ton of names. My favorite name for this animal is actually a mountain screamer, which I never understood until I heard one scream, and oh, holy moly, yeah, it sounds like a woman is dying when a mountain lion is screaming somewhere. It is really horrible. It's really bad. So I understand why they're called mouse screams. Anyway, this uh, Santa Cruz Puma project, one of their goals is to try to understand how connected the different mountain lion populations that are in the different mountain ranges in California. Um, and it's funded in part by the state who wants to know how the roadways that go between the mountain lion ranges are impacting their, their ability to go back and forth across the roads. Um, and we get some money from US Fish and Wildlife Service and other development agencies who want to know what the impact of urban, urbanized areas and farmlands in addition to the roads might be on limiting their ability to disperse. So we got involved in this project to see if we could link genetics to the data that they were collecting from the mountain lion collars, um, the, the tracking data that they're collecting. And so in collaboration with some people from Brazil and some of the folks in my group, we sequenced genomes from mountain lions from several different populations in the U.S., some from our own little mountain lion range here, Santa Cruz, Santa Monica, these are down in California, uh, sorry, down in, down in in Los Angeles, California, we had individuals from Yellowstone National Park and some individuals from Florida. Florida panthers are a subspecies or subpopulation of mountain lions. But we also had two individuals from Brazil where the population is doing much better than it is in the US. And based on these genetic data, we learned two things about mountain lions. We learned, first of all, that all of the individuals in North America, so this is a plot 
that's called a PSMC plot, that's not important. What it is, what it does is it shows how the population size of mountain lions has changed over the course of time, from 10 million years ago to the present day. And what's important about this plot is you see that these two lines, all these lines are the same until about here, when all of the individuals from the North American populations suddenly start to go along a different trajectory than the individuals from South America. We think this is when the two populations diverge, suggesting that although mountain lions probably evolved in North America, at some point they went extinct in North America and then were recolonized by mountain lions that moved up into North America from South America. This is important because what it means is that all of the mountain lions in North America have reduced genetic diversity. They're starting with only a subset of the genetic diversity that was present in South America. And then if we look at each of the populations separately, we find that there's quite a lot of isolation. The individuals from Santa Monica, from Santa Cruz, from Florida are very closely related to each other rather than to the other individuals. So there does seem to be a lot of restricted gene flow that seems to have begun within the last couple of hundred years. But most importantly, here's a kind of confusing plot, but I'm going to walk you through this to explain what it means. Most importantly, we're finding evidence that these populations that are isolated from each other are really badly inbred. They're suffering from inbreeding. So what this is, is this is a plot that shows how much diversity there is along one of the chromosomes, or one of the, one of the parts of the genome that we're able to sequence. And these dots, if they're high, that's good. That means there's lots of diversity. And if they're low, that's bad. That means mom and dad have the same version of the gene that you can only have it if mom and dad shared a common ancestry that they got that version of the gene from. So in essence, the longer these colored dots are, where there's nothing there, the more inbred that population is. So while the Brazilian individuals are doing pretty good, there's lots of dots up here that aren't colored in, all of the other populations are doing really badly, especially the population in Florida, where most of the genome is showing signs of inbreeding and suffering from what we're called, what we call inbreeding depression. So what does that mean, actually, realistically, for these animals? In Florida, in about 1990, there were thought to be only 30 mountain lions left in the population. And they were all related to each other, and they were highly inbred. And what this meant for them was that they had actual physical deformations, this came to fail. They had heart defects, they were very disease-ridden. Um, they had malformed sperm, and most of them had undescended testicles. This was a population that was almost entirely unable to reproduce. So would it be possible to save this population using technologies, using biotechnology? Can we restore the genetic diversity in this population somehow before it's too late? In 1995, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service approved a plan to move eight female panthers from Texas, over here where the panthers still existed, into Florida. They were chosen because they were the most geographically proximate population, therefore probably the most closely related population. They moved eight individuals from Texas into Florida. Five of those reproduced, and over the course of the next few years, produced 20 kittens. And almost immediately, all of the signs of inbreeding depression disappeared. The kink tails went away, the heart defects were restored, and they were able to reproduce. This population was genetically rescued. Individuals were chosen from a population based on how the diversity of that population had lost, and they were brought into that population and rescued. This is the transition to pathway B, which I'm going to encourage you to think of. Everybody knows who this is, right? This is a scientist from Jurassic Park. <laughs> It's not always about moving genes between different taxa. And I'm hoping that you will agree with me, those of you who are stuck on A, that this is a pretty reasonable, sensible use of technology that isn't at all scary, that has incredible benefits to population into which the genetic diversity flows. But translocations like this don't always work. There's another example of translocation that happened. This is Isle Royale, which is a national park in Michigan, in the United States. Isle Royale is about um, 400 kilometers squared, maybe a little bit bigger, so it's a tiny little thing. Nobody really knows how long there have been wolves on Isle Royale, but it's thought that in the 1940s or so, a uh, population was established, maybe three staff, 
average, maybe augmented by only about two or three individuals. And they survive there for a really long time. The wolves come across whenever the lake freezes over, and they can make that 24-kilometer wander across the ice from the mainland onto Isle of Whale. And this ice is not forming so much anymore because there's just not that much because of global warming, right? Um, this ice is not forming that much anymore, and so they didn't have many other wolf reintroductions that were there. While they were contemplating what they should do about this, there was a really cold season, and there was an individual who's called Old Gray Guy who wandered across the ice and established himself in this population. And everybody was hopeful that this would be that nobody had to do any actual translocations. It was a natural genetic rescue experiment, and for a little while it worked. He quickly established his own his own um, little herd and, and outcompeted all of the others, and everything went well. But in about a decade, every wolf on Isle Royale was related to him, and all of the deformities that were common before he got over there um, started to reemerge. So why, in this case, did the translocation fail? And one of the hints for why that it failed also comes, interestingly, from our mountain lion project. Because the 1995 translocation of Texas panthers wasn't the first time that there had been an augmentation of the Florida panther population through genetics. There used to be two different populations of Florida panthers, one in Big Cypress National Preserve, which is up here, and the other one in Everglades National Park. And in the 1960s, the people who were managing Big Cypress Preserve asked this guy, Les Piper, who had a little roadside show with mountain lions in Bonita Springs, Florida, if he would consider giving some of his panthers to the park so that they could augment their population. They did not know at the time that Les had already augmented his population by hybridizing his panthers with mountain lions from Costa Rica. And so when he took his Fitter goes reaping mountain lions and introduced them into the park. He introduced this genetically rescued individual, or multiple genetically rescued individuals into that park. Unfortunately, this population didn't make it. Their habitat was um, much more fragmented than that further south, and the entire population went extinct prior to um, the Texas Panther reintroduction. But as part of our project, Steve O'Brien, who had discovered this accidental introduction when he was doing some work uh, with Melanie Roca um, before genome times, uh, he sent us one of these um, admixed individuals from poor. We could do genetic analyses of this individual. And what we found was evidence, first of all, that it was an admixed individual. This is the individual from that park who is more closely related to the Brazilian individuals than to any of the individuals from North America based on a type of DNA inherited only from mom. And if we look at the whole genome, he still looks like Florida panthers, but there is an enormous bit of DNA that's coming to him from these Brazilian individuals. So this is definitely an admixed panther. But what does his inbreeding look like if we look at that plot? And here what we see is that if you look at these dotted lines here, they're kind of higher for the Brazilian individuals than it is for the North American individuals. This is because there's more diversity in Brazil than in North America. And this individual has that higher amount of diversity, as if they came from South America. But they also have these long tracks of inbreeding that happen because your mom and your dad often have a very close common ancestor. So what we've learned from this is that, yes, we can rescue these populations by bringing in genetic diversity from outside. But if the population remains small and it remains isolated, that it will continue to inbreed, and all of the signs of inbreeding depression will return. That one generation of inbreeding isn't enough. If we're going to get our hands dirty, and we're going to start translocating individuals from place to place, we have to keep doing it. Once isn't going to be enough. If we're in it, we have to be in it. So it's great for the Panthers when we can go outside of that population, find individuals that have that diversity that's lost, but what if you're from a species where there is only one population left? And a good example of that is the black-footed ferret. Black-footed ferret lives across the plains of North America. Its favorite food is the prairie dog. Prairie dogs are best known for being pains in the butt. They create these like enormous, like myriad, um, labyrinthine things underneath farms. And for the last century, at least, people have been trying to get rid of them. They've been very successful in doing so. The populations of of prairie dogs have gone down considerably, but as have the populations of black-footed ferrets. 
In Lassiter's effort to save the black-footed ferrets in the mid-1980s, U.S. Fish and Wildlife took the last of the black-footed ferrets that were in the wild into a captive breeding facility and tried to make more black-footed ferrets. And black-footed ferrets are really good at making more black-footed ferrets. This was an incredibly successful captive breeding program. However, there are two challenges. First, there was only a small number of individuals left, and that small number of individuals have now been used to make everybody else. They are suffering from an inbreeding depression. And second, when you release the captive bred black food ferrets into the wild, they almost immediately eat a fairy dog, which gives them sulfatic plague, and they die. So this is not good. You can vaccinate them at the captive breeding facility, but you have to capture them again and revaccinate them from the wild. And any individual born in the wild has to be captured and vaccinated and captured and revaccinated. This is not a sustainable conservation strategy. But there are two potential solutions to this. First, at the San Diego Frozen Zoo, which is an amazing place, Ollie Ryder here has been collecting samples, tissue samples, and cryopreserving them of endangered species and lots of things in these frozen tissue culture eggs for the last several decades. They have at the San Diego Frozen Zoo two different black-footed ferret tissue lines from individuals that lived prior to that bottleneck that caused the diversity and the inbreeding depression that's there. If those could somehow be cloned, these are frozen tissues of so living cells, if these could be cloned, then they could potentially be brought into that population, restoring genetic diversity. And second, and potentially more interesting, the cousin of the black hooded ferret, the domestic ferret, has natural immunity to plague. And there are teams of scientists that are searching through the genomes and doing experiments to try to figure out what it is about the genome of the domestic ferret that makes them immune to plague. If we could discover this, maybe we could use gene editing technologies to transfer that genetic resistance to plague from the domestic ferret to the black hooded ferret augmenting their genome using biotechnology in a way that makes them resistant to play, giving them a fighting chance at survival. So again, genetic rescue is sometimes moving DNA from one animal to another, but I would say that there are some compelling cases. Of course, you could argue, we don't, we don't, we don't really know what parts of the genome we're looking for, we don't really know what to do, this is a long way away, but it's not, there actually is a genetically rescued gene-edited organism that is currently going through phases of approval by three different regulatory agencies in the US. Can you know what it is? The American chestnut tree. The American chestnut tree used to be incredibly widespread across the country. But in the early 20th century, there was a fungus, a blight, that was introduced from Japan accidentally. And over the course of a few decades, more than three billion trees were felled. They don't die immediately. The roots um, sometimes sprout new, new little bits of trees, but as soon as it gets to a certain width, the fungus it actually releases acid that burns through the, the tree and causes it to die again. There are also some American chestnut trees that have been taken to different parts of the world, or actually some in the Pacific Northwest that don't get the blood. So there are some genetic resources that might be useful if this population could somehow be cured of this blight that is killing it. And Bill Powell, who's at the SUNY in New York, um, began a genetic engineering program to try to create a blight-resistant tree. And he actually has succeeded in doing this. He's found a gene in wheat. Most plants have genes that actually allow them to, to take care of this acid, to break the acid down so that it doesn't actually destroy the plant. He picked the wheat because we know a lot about the wheat genome and how to manipulate it. This doesn't mean that the American chestnuts that grow in this are going to be full of gluten. It's just one gene, right? Still, still not wheat. And he has created some American chestnut trees that are transgenic. They have a wheat gene that makes them resistant to this life. This is an amazing technology, an amazing resource. And this is potentially the first transgenic organism that has been developed explicitly for the purpose of reforestation, of bringing a species back that was extinct. Kind of extinct, because it wasn't necessarily dead. This technology could be used for lots of things. Uh, there's a team in Australia that's working on developing approaches to genetically engineer corals and their symbionts so that the corals are better able to survive in warmer waters. What if we could use this technology to identify resistance alleles to things like the bark beetle that are destroying things, or to, to make small mammals, or the hosts 
of diseases like tick-borne encephalitis resistant to a disease so they couldn't pass it on. These are technologies that we want and technologies that we need, and I would say these are technologies that we shouldn't be afraid to explore and think about. Of course, there's risks associated with all of this, and we still have a lot to learn. We don't know very much about the genomes of most of these things that we want to manipulate, but if this is all things that we can learn, we can get there as long as we allow ourselves to take a little bit of a risk. So what about de-extinction? First of all, I hate this word, de-extinction. What I hate the most about it is conjugating it, right? What would you say if you actually did this? What would you, I mean, you would, you de-extincted something? That's terrible, right? It's terrible. De-extinctified? There was once a headline that said that, I did not read the article. <laughs> Of course, we're all very excited about the extinction, right? We, we were there the last time it happened. <laughs> it went really well, so clearly we want to do it again. Can we think about the extinction things? What we always think was the extincting, you see? When we think about doing this, all what we normally think about is cloning, right? We're going to clone an animal. We're going to clone a dinosaur. We're going to clone a passenger pigeon. But cloning is actually a very specific scientific process called somatic cell nuclear transfer. Basically, our bodies are made up of two different types of cells, somatic cells, which are all the different cells in our body, except for the germ cells, which are sperm and eggs. And the trick in somatic cell nuclear transfer is to take a cell, a somatic cell, not a sperm or an egg, normally those two would come together and fuse and create an embryo, and that's how stuff is supposed to work. But instead, to take a somatic cell, one that already has DNA from mom and dad, and trick it into forgetting all of the instructions necessary to be a heart cell or a liver cell or a skin cell and reverting back to that early form where it can start to divide and differentiate and become all the different types of an animal. What's the most famous clone? Dolly the sheep. So this is how it works, right? Here we have uh, the somatic cell donor for Dolly the sheep. So what was actually these were mammary cells. They took these mammary cells, they put them in a dish, starved them with nutrients, just to stress them out. The same time you get another sheep who has egg cells that are ready to be fertilized, but instead of letting them be fertilized, you suck out the nuclear material there, that's all the DNA that's going to teach that thing how to be called the sheep. And then you have this empty egg cell, these stressed out somatic cells. You put them next to each other, zap them with electricity that causes the membrane here to open up, and this dumps this tissue in here. You zap them again, and then the proteins in the egg cells do that magic of coaxing that cell to forget all of the instructions, which genes need to be on and off, and how much need to be on or off, necessary to be a mammary cell, and revert to that state where it can start to divide and develop and eventually become Dolly, right? So this is how it works. This is how cloning works. So why wouldn't this work with a man? What's the first step? <laughs> That's not going to happen. We have a lot of incredibly well-reserved mammoth remains and remains of other things, but they are not living cells. What happens when an animal dies and the DNA is exposed to that? The DNA starts immediately to be chopped down into smaller and smaller and smaller pieces until eventually there's nothing there. UV radiation, we put on sunscreen before we go outside because we know that UV hits our DNA and it breaks it. And if we didn't have root radiant enzymes that fix that, then we'd be cancer every time we go outside. Of course, having that enzyme to fix the breaks from UV is an energy requiring process, and after you die, that stops. So those breaks just accumulate. You get more and more and more of them until eventually the DNA is chopped up into tiny fragments. Freezing and thawing expands and contracts the water inside the cells, physically breaking the DNA, and then microbes, like fungi and bacteria that live in the soil or in the gut of the animal, also act to break down the DNA. So if you think of modern DNA, like if I extract DNA from myself as a really long and lovely, glorious party streamer, ancient DNA that we get out of these tiny, tiny little chopped up fragments of nonsense, there's not going to be any living, contiguous, long fragments of DNA in any mammal cell or any, any organism that's been dead for more than a couple of hours. So there's not going to be living mammal cells, so we are not going to clone mammals. I'm sorry. No. Not going to happen. Fortunately, there is another approach that we might want to use. We now have genome sequences from 
maybe a couple dozen mammoths, and we have genome sequences from Asian elephants, this is the closest living relative to mammoths, and we can line them all up in a computer and then ask where they're different from each other. Identify all of those places in the DNA sequence where mammoths have one letter and elephants have another letter. And it turns out there are about one and a half million of those across a four billion letter genome that distinguish mammoths from elephants. And then, that's about one and a half percent, about as different between, uh, between Asian elephants and mammoths as we are from chimpanzees. And then, once we know what all those differences are, we can use genome editing to turn a living elephant cell, in addition to lab, into a living elephant cell that now contains those mammoth DNA letters. Right? So how does genome editing work? CRISPR doesn't look like this. <laughs> But I really like this as a way of describing what's like. Imagine you could have a little tiny robot that you could program to go to a very specific place in the genome and make a very specific change. And you sent that robot with a tiny little package, and that package contains the information saying what change to make into the cells. The robot would go into the cell, swim around, and find exactly that place in the genome, grab a hold, and then do its thing. This is actually how it works. This is kind of what it looks like. Here's your robot. Now I'm switching over here, keeping it, keeping it, keeping it on your toes. This is the robot. This is called a guide RNA. This is the bit of DNA here. That's what you want to change. Here's a little package that we've sent in. This is the mammoth version of the DNA. The robot goes in there and it says, whoa, I don't like this spot, and it cuts it. And now your cell is broken DNA and it freaks out. And there are a couple of different mechanisms that evolution has made to fix that. One of them will line up the other chromosome, remember we have two, one from mom and one from dad, and use that as a way of fixing that break. But we've sent in this package full of these little green bits of DNA, and we're hoping that it finds these before it finds the other chromosome. And when it does that, it will actually fix that break with this bit of mammoth DNA sequence. You end up with an elephant genome that is a And all we have to do is do this one and a half million times, and then we're there. So what, what do we change? We can't actually make more than a half million changes. We have to, we have to make some decisions. A couple of years ago, there was a team from Manitoba um, led by uh, Kevin Campbell. And what they discovered was that in the gene, the hemoglobin gene that's in your red blood cells, is responsible for carrying oxygen around, woolly mammoths and Asian elephants are different by three different mutations. And when he did an experiment in the lab to see what these three different mutations did, he discovered that these woolly mammoth red blood cells were better at carrying oxygen around when it was really cold. So this seems like an ideal mutation to make if you want to take a tropically adapted elephant and stick it in Siberia, right? So here is one thing. Great, what else should we change? Well, there's a, there's a team at Harvard led by George Church. That's George right there. And they have so far made 50 different changes, according to George, in the cells that they are growing in the lab. 50 different genes, all associated with things like thicker subcutaneous fat and things that you might imagine you might want to change to create a mammoth from an elephant. So they have a, a cell growing in the dish in their lab that's 99 point, there's probably more zeros in there, zero, 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 one. Remember, it started off as already 99% mammoth, okay? So it's just a little bit more, right? And it sells growing in the dish in the lab. That is a really different thing from actually having a mammoth. So if we think about this, we can go out there, we can get the, the, the genome, the DNA from these things, we can sequence the genomes, we can do the genome editing, and then we actually have a living cell that we can put into a somatic cell to do that kind of magical thing. And then we might be able to transform that into an embryo, find a surrogate host, have it develop a term. Um, I like to call this phase two of de-extinction. People don't really think much about phase two, but I think it's really important and we probably should be paying more attention to this. So what about this surrogate maternal host? How are we going to find an appropriate surrogate maternal host for these things? Some people might think, oh, it would be really easy. It's just an elephant, and a mammoth is quite like an elephant, and it's only one and a half percent different. Surely a female elephant will be able to carry a mammoth to term, right? But remember, that's the same amount of differences as between us and chimpanzees, right? Could we carry a chimpanzee to term? or a chimpanzee carry a human? Probably not. There's a lot of differences that happen in that 1%. Even if that could happen, the gene expression, the developmental processes that are underway, are acted on by more than just the sequence of A's and C's and G's and T's in the genome of the developing embryo, but also by the DNA from the mom, by her diet, by her hormones, whatever 
stressing her out. Are the changes that are going to happen in utero going to be driven by the changes that we've made in the DNA sequence, or are they going to be driven by the mom who's an elephant? And elephants also do this practice after birth called coprophagy, where the mom feeds the baby a little bit of her own poop. That's to establish a community of microorganisms in their gut that they need to eat the food that they eat. We don't know very much about how important that community of microorganisms in our gut are to making us look and act the way we do, but we're learning more about this and we know that they're important. Those are going to be elephant microorganisms, not mammoth microorganisms. And they're going to be taught how to live like this incredibly social group of organisms by other elephants. And they're going to eat whatever it is that elephants can eat in captivity. And speaking of elephants in captivity, for any one of the species that we're considering to bring back to life, there are always going to be different technical challenges, and there are certainly going to be different ethical challenges. We know that elephants don't fare well in captivity. They often don't breed. If they do, they sometimes injure or even kill or young. Until we figure out how to meet the physical, psychological needs of elephants in captivity, they shouldn't be in captivity at all, much less being used for some crazy, harebrained, dare I say, experiment to bring these same species back to life. And finally, I think possibly most importantly, what will we do with these extinct species? And here I bring it back to the question that I was asking you in the first place. If we think about passenger pigeons, this is another candidate for de-extinction. This is a species of bird that flocked into billions with a B, billions. This is what their habitat looks like now. It used to go from masking forest stands to masking forest stand, and all of that has been replaced by us, mammoths. Remember what their habitat looked like from the beginning? Where they had all that rich, diversity of grassland that they could feed on? This is what their habitat looks like now. The truth is that ecosystems change. There is no stasis. When an organism goes extinct, the ecosystem doesn't just freeze, waiting for that thing to be brought back. If we were to bring something back into the present climate, it would be an invasive species introduced into an ecosystem into which it was not adapted. And what is the goal anyway? We often think of the past as some incredible pristine, some magical place that's somehow uncontaminated by what we've done. But if we want to turn this part of the world into some pristine, what are we going for? Prior to European arrival? Prior to the extinction of the megafauna 10,000 years ago? Prior to the first appearance of humans 20,000 years ago? Who are we to decide what this is? Or where to go? Can we bring extinct species back to life? No. There are some technical hurdles, and maybe for some species where the technical hurdles aren't as great, we will eventually get to a place where we can. But we're not close. But I think more importantly, the question is, should we bring it back to life? And to me, I don't think there's a compelling reason to think about bringing something back once it's been gone for quite a long time. I think if we think about species that are on the brink of extinction, then maybe there's rationale to using genetic rescue technologies, the same technologies that we would need to develop in order to bring extinct species back to life, to give them the capacity to adapt and evolve. Think about the northern white rhinos. Last year, the last male northern white rhino died. There are two females left. They're related to each other. There are cells at the San Diego Frozen Zoo that could be used to create a different physically related more than white rhino. Is this something we might want to do? Or what about thinking about adding different adaptations to the species that are alive today? What if we could take Asian elephants, tropically adapted elephants, and give them adaptations that would allow them to survive in cooler climates, potentially places where there wouldn't be as much danger to their long-term survival? I think if we look at the range of species today that are faced with extinction, then this is where our, our energy and our effort should go. It's the same technology. If we need to talk about bringing mammoths back to life in order to excite people about this, then so be it. I'm all good for that. But I really think that our energy should be focused here, on the species that are alive today, but night might not be tomorrow. So where do I end? I think we do need to keep doing all the things that we do in Plan A. Let's protect the habitat. Let's stop moving invasive species around. Let's conserve our resources and limit what we're putting out into rivers, and the ocean, and on the land. And let's develop new practices for energy, sustainability, and farming. 
But let's not be afraid of these new technologies that might give us another tool in what should be an increasingly large toolbox that we want to use to try to deal with the extinction crisis that is clearly underway. Let's use technology to manage populations. Let's sequence genomes and identify individuals that we might translocate between spaces. But let's also consider these more kind of crazy outlandish things that we don't quite know how to do yet. Yes, these technologies are risky. Yes, we need to fully evaluate the risks of using these technologies before we use them, before we release species into a habitat. But I would argue that it's far more risky not to do this. That the pace of biodiversity loss today is far greater than it has been in the past, and that this is clearly our fault. And my argument is that we allow ourselves the freedom to explore these technologies, to learn about what can be done, and what the challenges and opportunities might be, so that we can live in a future with fewer headlines like this. Thank you.